Guys, thank you all so much for being here. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Josh Mora. I am the program director of the sports marketing and media degree here at Full Sail University. Uh, this is a great panel. I'm so I've been looking forward to this since we started to put it together. We have two outstanding guests. Uh, first, to my immediate left, uh, ESPN Sports Center anchor Kevin Nagandi. And uh, a little bit further away from me, uh, the president and COO of the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network and the executive vice president of the Baltimore Orioles, John Angelos. So it is, it is great to have you guys here. And, and the topic, as it's titled, is Sports Media Today. Uh, I think for context, we're talking about media with a capital M. So not so much reporters chasing athletes through locker rooms, but the idea of how you guys as fans and consumers of sport, and all of us as fans and consumers of sports, ingest sports product and sports content. And we're going to look at that uh, from the perspective of a national sports network and a regional sports network and a property and team uh, this one from Major League Baseball, but maybe there'll be some broader conclusions and inferences they can draw from that as well. So may maybe, guys, if you would start by telling us a little bit about your careers and uh, how you guys were able to get to this point in your careers and this current job that you hold. Uh, the one thing I tell... By the way, it's great to be here. Uh, I love the turnout, and this is my first time on campus. You guys are the lucky ones. Uh, this past week, it snowed about, I would say, a total of... 20 inches where I live this past week, not the past month or the past season, the past week. So it's good to see the sun. Um, I, I, the one thing I always tell people about my journey is uh, it wasn't uh, the normal uh, journey, but I think any sports guest you talk to at ESPN, we all have our own unique journey. Uh, I could tell you at age 14, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to become this first Indian American uh, to do uh, sports on a national network and ESPN. I wanted to be on Sports Center each and every day. Uh, to to get that chance to do it every day is amazing and realize that dream. But uh, I didn't do it when I was 14, 15, 16. There were so many other stumbling blocks I had to go through. I originally went to Syracuse University. Uh, I realized that the school doesn't make you after one semester. It's what you do at the school. Let's just say at 18, I had too much fun being away from my family. Uh, I transferred back and I came uh, back to Philadelphia. I went to Temple University. And one of the things I stress to uh, college kids is get involved. Uh, I did five internships uh, in two and a half years and I got four other jobs at the same time uh, in my four years at Temple. I maximized everything I was gonna do on campus to get that experience uh, that I wasn't gonna get in the classroom uh, or through a book. Uh, so the hands-on training, you guys are doing that already now in these classrooms. Uh, some, or I should say most universities do that, but they don't do it until your junior or senior year. I was doing it by the time I was uh, my second uh, semester, uh, my freshman year. So out of that, at 23, I got my first TV job uh, on the air in Philadelphia uh, doing a high school sports show. And uh, I wanted to do live TV because it was a weekly show. So I went to Kirksville, Missouri. Uh, market 199 out of like 215. You know how when Columbus was uh, going around the world, they said, you know, the world is a square. You're going to fall off. I was on the edge. That's how small this town was, Kirksville, Missouri. Uh, but I got to tell you, I was there for 13 months working at an ABC station. It was the best 13 months looking back for me. Uh, I was young. I could make mistakes. But at the same time, I covered Mark McGuire's home run chase back in 1998. Uh, I was with the Rams the year before, Kurt Warner and the greatest show on turf. So I covered a lot of big things at the age of 23, uh, which was great for me. I went to uh, Sarasota, Florida after that. Yes. <laughs> and I was there for three years. Had an amazing time there covering the Bucks. Uh, when they were very, very good with Tony Dungy and Warren Sapp and company, uh, but also covering Florida State, Florida, and Miami each and every weekend. And this is when Miami was in their heyday. Uh, Bowden was still at Florida State, and Spurrier was uh, ruling the land at Florida. So I got that experience, and then I got out of TV, believe it or not, uh, in 2003. And then a year later, I got back in the TV, and I went back to Sarasota, and it was the best move I ever did. 
or ever made. And then within uh, two years, uh, an agent started kicking the tires and said, give me a chance. Let me see what I could do. I had dealt with an agent before, a big agency called SFX. Uh, they were very big. I was 25. They were way too big for me. Uh, then I got with an agent who, who wanted to do a, a personal guide for me in the sense of finding my career, which is pretty funny being on this panel because John doesn't know this. But he said, give me, the guy, the agent said, give me six months, handshake agreement, and we'll see what we can do. And I said, I'm, I'm pretty happy in Sarasota. This is what he did. He called me in two months and said, there's a startup called Masson, and I think I can get you an interview there. Uh, they haven't opened yet in production. I said, okay. Well, it turns out he called me a week later. He said, Masson's going to postpone production for a couple months, so we'll get the interview a little bit later on in the year. I said, okay. Then he goes, how about a a job interview at, in Bristol, Connecticut. And immediately, uh, any kid that follows sports knows where Bristol, Connecticut is and what's in Bristol, Connecticut, and that was ESPN. Uh, I went up there for a job interview, uh, very intense. Uh, to me, it was like, hey, if I don't get it, I don't get it. But at least I went up there on their dime. I got the chance to be in their studio. I competed against seven other anchors. I beat them all out. I've been at ESPN for seven years. So again, the journey... It's not in a book. Each of you guys, if you guys get somewhere where you want to be in the beginning, you can map it all out, but you're going to take different paths to eventually get to the final destination. Good. Well, uh, we do have Sarasota, Florida in common. Yes, that's we do. A, and we I didn't know we had Masson in yeah, common. That's that, really or we almost had Masson yeah. in common. That's interesting. Um, I, I was born and raised in Baltimore and um, I never really, I was always an Orioles fan and a sports fan, but I had never had any um, in inkling or uh, all that much of an inclination necessarily to head towards sports. I was headed towards a legal career. Um, I, I spent four years at Duke University and uh, was uh, finishing up law school when a group of uh, uh, people from the Baltimore area got together. Um, many of them well known, and the Orioles at that time had been owned by out of town. Uh, owners, first Edward Bennett Williams, who was a famous attorney from Washington, D.C., um, famous both as a, as, as, as a lawyer and then later as a sports team owner, and then later a gentleman named Eli Jacobs. And, and the team um, became uh, embroiled in a, in, a, in a bankruptcy action that had nothing to do with the team itself but with the personal fortunes of, of Mr. Jacobs. And the team was actually going to be uh, privately sold to a group of people from Cincinnati, um, and uh, a group of Baltimoreans got together uh, who included uh, uh, some relatively well-known people in, in entertainment and, uh, and sports, and including uh, Tom Clancy, the re uh, to very recently late author, uh, was one of our partners, Barry Levinson, uh, the, the Hollywood director, uh, Jim McKay, who um, pioneered in many ways wide world of sports and so many things in sports, um, and whose uh, 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 son, Sean McManus, is a, is a key figure in sports television today, of course. Um, Pam Shriver, the tennis player, and many, many other people, including my family, got involved in putting together a local ownership group. Interestingly, some of the other people who were bidding on the team uh, and became our, our partners uh, and going in with us instead of uh, uh, attempting to buy the Orioles, later went on to own, uh, in the case of the DeWitt family, the Cardinals, in the case of the Castellini family, the Reds. So our group has not only had an interesting uh, entertainment background and sports background, but has sort of blossomed into owning a number of sports franchises. Um, when, when our group got involved in sports uh, 22 years ago um, through the Orioles, uh, I sort of sidelined my interest in um, uh, certain things. And my personal interests were in things along the lines of consumer advocacy, more left-leaning, progressive, and, and community-oriented things. And um, one thing that interested me about the Orioles and sports was not only was I a fan and a Baltimorean, um, but I was very interested in the community platform and the good works you can do with a sports team. Uh, uh, sports teams uh, get so much free media, and when you win, of course, that's that's great free media, and you're 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 the smartest 
group of people in the room, and when you lose, um, you're the dumbest guys in the room. Um, <laughs> we were really smart when we bought the Orioles but because the Orioles had not been in the playoffs for 14, 13 seasons, and we immediately went to two straight ALCSs. Actually, our first season um, was the strike in baseball, so that was uh, sort of a, an interesting way to begin owning a franchise. But right after that, we went to two straight ALC American League championships, and everybody loved us, and then we lost for about a dozen years, and everybody <laughs> hated us. So um, uh, more, more recently, um, we've been back in the playoffs and playing rather well, so we've regained our... Um, our uh, I, uh, intelligence, intelligence quotient. Um, about a dozen years or so, we started to uh, get into uh, uh, television and media. And we did that really um, indirectly um, and not, I, I tell you, we, we, we'd always thought about the opportunity to develop a regional sports network. The Red Sox, uh, under the previous ownership group, had really pioneered that. We're way ahead of the curve of all sports teams in developing the New England Sports Network, um, which at that time was on a pay tier. It was not on basic cable. It was a it was a totally different model. But they nonetheless really were ahead of everybody. And then m many years after that, the Yankees developed the Yes Network. Um, and around that same time, we and prior to that, really, we had been started into the over-the-air television network. We were producing 65 games packages and I immediately gravitated towards that area in addition to my sports team involvement um, for a variety of reasons. The sports franchise gives you great access to community relations and branding and marketing and doing good things but when you bring in the television platform which we'll talk more about um, it really gives you a 360 degree opportunity. So I've spent 20 plus years on the team side and about 10 to 12 years on the media side and um, as this has evolved, um, I think the, my original interest, which was in the, the things that you can do with that sports team platform, that brand and that content, and how you can use that to, to drive uh, community interest and create charitable and civic and philanthropic benefits um, for your hometown region um, is even greater now. Uh, because once you control your own media, the, uh, the benefits are so much bigger. So that, that's a little bit about my history. So maybe you can elaborate on that because it's an interesting point where, you know, the in the last 15 or 20 years as regional sports networks uh, started to blossom and you went from having people who were journalists who were covering events and were supposed to be objective. Now the team is an owner in the network and the, the purpose may be sort of quasi-journalism, but it's also about promoting uh, the ownership. That's clearly the reason for those uh, networks to exist in many ways. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how, how that relationship uh, sometimes works uh, for a regional sports network that has team ownership involved. Well, I think the first reason that, that, that you look at getting into the, the RSN business if you're a team owner uh, is the same reason you look at, look at getting into any compatible or ancillary business. Whether, certainly the RSN opportunity is the most potentially substantial, significant from a branding marketing standpoint and, and from a financial standpoint if you have certain market forces at work. But, but you look at it in many ways in the same way you would look at do I go into my own food and beverage business? Do I run my own parking lot? Do I want to take control of my ancillary events? Do I want to go into the music promotion business or the ticketing business or any of these other, do I want to have a marketing group like, for instance, the Fenway Sports Group has? These are all, once you have control of the brand, once you have a brand, and that's the interesting thing that you've got this Orioles brand or Yankees brand or what have you, and you have, particularly in baseball, it's not it's not true in the other leagues in the same way as in baseball. But in baseball, when you, are, when you have a group that owns a franchise, you own the franchise, you own the brand, and you own a television territory. The television territory is actually part of what you buy. So when you own those three things, you start to think about the other business you can get into. The television business, the regional sports network business, historically, um, other entities – typically large media conglomerates, um, have uh, vertically integrated from being distributors um, where they're cable, satellite, or telecom companies and started to develop principally regional sports networks. Why regional sports? They also develop movie networks and so forth. If you go back to the 1980s when cable was just starting to blossom, what really drove the expansion of cable television subscriptions 
uh, well, pr principally sports and movies. So what used to be on tiers, HBO and sports networks started to migrate downward to what was then called basic cable, what's now, what's now more commonly referred to as expanded basic cable. What, that's what attracted us to the business. That's why everybody looks at the business. Not everybody can do that. Um, you get into it because you go from having to deal with a rights holder somebody from, and, and these people, these are all good companies that do many great things, but when you're in a rights holder agreement, whether that rights holder is your television rights holder, your, your radio rights holder, your food and beverage right holds, rights holder, you're not necessarily always aligned in what you're doing. You've got to go to that partner, and hopefully it's a good partnership. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's less so. And you have to negotiate everything as you go. The, the media companies in one business, they're trying to grow eyeballs. They may be trying to serve the parent company's interests as well, which is, can be a distributor, a cable company. But you're in the sports business and you're in your branding business. We ultimately said, let's take control. Let's not bid our rights out anymore. Let's bring our rights back in house. We can produce the games ourselves. We can do the distribution ourselves. The last piece of that to your question is, what happens from a journalistic standpoint? How do you preserve your integrity as a journalistic entity? Do you break all the, for instance, do, do you break all the stories yourself and try and mm -hmm. uh, keep the information to yourself and not let the local over the air stations or the competing RSN, if there's another RSN in your market, or even, even a, a, a much larger entity like ESPN, do you try and keep that entity exclusive? Uh, our answer to that was no. Um, you, you would not do that. You would certainly invest in your own uh, reporters, your own uh, uh, website, your own mobile uh, platforms, and you do all that for a variety of branding reasons. After all, the reason the RSN exists is to support the team, make the teams right. bigger. We have a seven state region from Southern Pennsylvania to North Carolina that the team owns. So, and the nationals were, have, a, have an ownership stake in the network. So the purpose of the network is to grow the baseball brand, make more people like the Nationals, like the Orioles. We t for people who don't know, we televise all the games of both the, the Orioles and the Washington Nationals. So the RSNs jointly owned and jointly markets the two. You do have to keep journalistic integrity. Um, we do not try and uh, keep information from others. We don't tell Buck Walter, our manager, our players, not to talk to Comcast or not to talk to the, the, the CBS affiliate. Uh, we have actual partnerships with some of those entities. So we don't act proprietary with the information because I think we'd lose credibility. And I don't think we, we feel like we need to do that. We'll get, we'll get the best reporters we can. The first reporter we hired was the most popular sort of cutting edge reporter for the Baltimore Sun. And they were cutting back. And this fellow had spent 50, his name's Rock Kubatko, and he had spent the prior 10 or 15 years w before anybody was really doing it, especially not at the newspapers, building up uh, a blog following. So Rock had built up this huge blog following and he had uh, followers of, on all different platforms and we targeted him, we brought him over to Masson. But we didn't tell Rock, you know, this is the way you're gonna operate because now you work for a team-owned media entity. We told him, do what you did when you were at The Sun and that'll serve you well, that'll serve us well and that'll build the brand. We'll get to some of the content, John, that you guys are creating on the team side of things. And I know that some of that with baseball is all locked up by uh, MLB AM or BAM, as you guys call it in baseball. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but Kevin, you know, ESPN has produced a lot of its own content over the years too. You guys may not remember that the X Games didn't exist. They were an ESPN invention and a very successful one. Um, you guys were in the movie business for a while. Yep. Uh, more lately, or more recently, the, uh, the documentary business with the 30 for 30 series. Um, and of course, all of the web content that you guys produce. So what we, maybe one thing that we can say is that the way that you guys consume content has changed over the past two years, five years, 10 years. Yeah. How does it change what you do uh, from, from the front line? I, I think you've seen a dramatic change in the last two years, just especially coming from the 30 for 30 documentaries. And it's not just us, it's really how it's affected the entire business. Um, HBO Real Sports, 60-minute uh, program, a magazine type of 60 minutes. Uh, so they were there before the 30 for 30s, but now you're starting to see 60 minutes get with Showtime and CBS with their joint venture as a magazine. Uh, you're seeing, obviously, uh, some of these regionals put together their own documentaries. Fox Sports 1 has a documentary uh, wing as well. So you're starting to see more of that programming uh, coming out because it's compelling. 
Uh, you need something also that's going to go uh, along with your live programming. I think that's the reason why regionals do so well. And, and John brought up movies. Movies are two-hour blocks. Live programming for sporting events, two- to three-hour blocks. So you need to fill time. And a lot of program directors look, how are we going to fill time? Uh, a 30 for 30 will take 60 minutes, potentially 90 minutes or 120 minutes. That's where you have an audience for longer than eight minute segments that we kind of measure rating wise on Sports Center. So you carry that long audience mm -hmm. and also it's appealing for advertisers. I think you're seeing that transform the last two years specifically with the 30 for 30s. So of course, if it's Yankees games, it's four hour blocks. Uh, yeah, yeah, Yankees, so, Red Sox, you have four right. and a half hours and we're in the ninth <laughs> inning. The, um, uh, with ESPN, it, it, TV ratings, the TV side of things, it, the ratings have been down the last little bit. But overall, when you consider all platforms, uh, eyeballs are definitely up. What do you think that says about where we're headed uh, as a sports viewing population? I think there's more choices. Uh, when you measure the ratings being down, you could say that across the board with right. every right. single network uh, because there are more choices and more ways to get that that programming that you want via – measured through mobile, uh, through apps, through anything on the internet, uh, watching on the web. I think, I think that now when you look at the numbers and the ratings, like you could take a look at the Super Bowl, the World Series, and the NBA Finals, matching them up from 10 years, 15, 20 years previously, the numbers will all be down just because of the way we consume. It's not the standard, hey, let's watch TV at home all together. Um, so for, for the way I process how I look at things, People are still watching, mm -hmm. it's just they're watching it differently. And when you have a measuring process a little more advanced than, I'd say, the Nielsen's, you'll get a better idea of right. where they're getting this information because I think it's the same sources. It's just not measured that way. So, John, for, from, from your perspective on the, on the team side of things, we, we certainly see that people are trying to find different content not only from their television network, or their, but it might be the team website or things that you guys can produce uh, on that end of the business. Is there, how do you guys parcel out what you do team-wise, network-wise, since you own both? Well, I, one, first off, when we started Masson, we made a conscious effort to invest um, as heavily as we responsibly could, which, was re which I thought was relatively heavily, in our website, in our um, content creation for the site, for our mobile applications, for our uh, text alerts, um, for our Facebook and Twitter social media platforms. Um, and we did that at a time when we knew with a startup RSN, with two teams, one was a brand new team in the Nationals who had just relocated from Montreal. The other was a team in the Orioles who at that time um, had been losing for a few years. So the Orioles still had relatively decent ratings given that they had been losing. The Nationals had relatively um, non-existent ratings because they were an, a, an expand, or, or a relocated team. So we knew that the investment in those other platforms was not going to generate any incremental revenue. And, and when I say not, I mean relatively none, um, little to none. Um, so if we were going to spend a half a million dollars or a million dollars a year to create all these things, it was going to be an investment in the future and would not generate any immediate returns. So, but we felt it was important. We felt it was important because, not just because everybody was doing it, but because as time went on, that would increasingly become a part of our ad budget. And it has. As the teams have played better, as the ratings, as the ratings have increased, um, not only have ad revenues gone up generally, but a greater and greater proportion of the ad uh, spending that we receive is being allocated to digital, digital uh, budgets. Um, the, by and large, when, when we go out on and sit with ad agencies and clients, um, it is somewhat church and state. You, 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 you try and sell integrated packages. You try and come in as an, as an RSN selling packages and say not only, hey, can you buy all of these DM – we have – we're in masses in six million homes, over six million homes, seven states, and 14 Nielsen DMAs. So we are the fourth largest combined media market 
if you aggregate Nielsen markets in the country. Um, so we try to sell everything. We try and say, you can buy DC, you can buy Baltimore, you can buy a seven state region, whatever you need. Some, if you're a car dealer group that just wants to hit Maryland, you buy one or the other. But then we also try and say, you can also integrate by buying on air linear television, all the digital platforms. And then the third way you can integrate is you can buy on the network, on a radio network, on digital platforms, you can buy in park for both teams and you can get connected with the two team brands as well as the mass and brand. Now, the issue in Major League Baseball, which you mentioned, is that Major League Baseball Advanced Media, which was something created a dozen years ago by the 30 teams, um, is owned equally by the 30 teams, is an entity that's had tremendous success over a dozen years in mining the digital value. And what ML BAM has done is standardize all the websites of the teams and the mobile and digital platforms generally, um, maximize or aggregated on uh, digital platform inventory to maximize or optimize those sales. The, the one issue that's hanging out there, though, in the development of ML BAM, and this applies to the other leagues, too, although recently the other leagues have started to let the rights go back to the teams, is the league has been holding um, the rights to distribute content, principally games, replays, live games, nearly live games, et cetera, highlights on the digital platforms. So uh, you can sit here today and watch uh, uh, the Rays, on your television as part of your expanded basic package, but you can't watch the Rays on your phone or on your tablet or what have you. That's gonna change, I would imagine, very soon. It's, it's, it should have probably changed earlier, but for a variety of reasons it hasn't. So for us, it was doubly important to get the network, the RSN out there with all of its digital power to get the brands out because the league wasn't really doing it in the way effectively that it could be done Planning, of course, the league is planning to do it eventually. So we had felt we had to be extra vibrant on the um, RSN side of our digital platforms. But even even if at this point the fans, these guys aren't watching the games on their phones, they do everything else on their phones, right? I mean, everyone, right. Right, your phones are another appendage. Um, to that extent, Kevin, how are you finding uh, that that has changed the way that fans are connecting with you because you know, right? I mean, they're doing something while they're watching you. Deep down, I'm a fan. So uh, that's how I got into this. Uh, on our way here uh, to the panel, I was following the uh, gold medal game uh, with the women um, against Canada and how they fell apart, but I was watching it on Twitter uh, and I, I need to get constant information updates. I, I think the interaction is, I, I'm gonna speak personally, I love it. Others may not. Others may not embrace it. I do. I think it's fantastic because you're getting more information. You have to sort out. You have to filter out that information to find out what's accurate, what isn't accurate. But you're getting the idea of what a fan's still thinking in this day and age. Uh, what you guys think about is a little bit different from what I thought about when I was, uh, you know, in college. So I'm getting that update and understanding, okay, what's most important? What's the biggest deal? Perfect example, um, Friday night, we did a story on SportsCenter uh, yesterday, actually the last couple days because it's made national news, but on Friday night, uh, there was a kid named Kevin Groh, uh, a senior basketball manager at, at Ben Salem High School outside of Philadelphia, has Down syndrome, and uh, he got into a basketball game, made a layup, and my Twitter timeline blew up with the hashtag get Kevin on Sports Center. And I was like, well, I already, I'm already on Sports Center. Who's Kevin? Like, what, who are they referring to? So I started doing some research. Then the next day, he played in uh, the senior night, uh, final game. He hit four threes in the final two minutes of the game and all of a sudden exploded. And not only was this a local Philadelphia story, it started becoming a national story. The Sixers got aware of it. And then the Sixers gave this young man a contract. We have video of it. We showed he was in the locker room. He was on a two-day con. And suddenly, a small little story inside a high school gym becomes a two-shot between me and Hannah Storm yesterday on National Network News introducing Kevin Groh to America. So to me, I think that's what we're, we're getting from that feedback using your mobile phone through Twitter, social media, or Facebook, and understanding that. And Now, we can't do that for every single story. 
But that gives you an idea of a small little story and how it can expand into something way bigger. And that's with that interaction with fans. And it's changed, too, the way that you present. I mean, you Absolutely. right? You run tweets as quotes. You yes, run, we do. Uh, you built a whole show, Sports Nation, around that kind of connectivity uh, between fans and media. Yes. And also, I think athletes are fully aware. Like, we saw Derek Jeter control basically the narrative of his retirement via Facebook with his own statement, his retirement statement. He controlled everything. And that's what Twitter, Facebook, and these social uh, media apps can do. And you're seeing athletes do that. And I think you're seeing fans embrace it because it, to a certain extent, eliminates the middleman where we are the media presenting it to you. But there is one issue. We're the ones that are asking the questions. So for the athletes, they just want to connect to you guys, but they don't want to hear some of the questions. They just want to go, this is how I feel, and that's it. Uh, the media's responsibility is, why do you feel this way? What did you do in this situation? Or even Buster only going one-on-one -on -one with Derek yesterday saying, give us an idea of what exactly happened, who did you tell first, and when. I mean, that process, you're not going to get through a Facebook statement. Yeah. John, have you found similar um, in the way that social media affects the live in-game experience from the team side again? Yeah, and I, and I should say we, we're, we're able to do a couple things. What, so for the Orioles, we have two reporters who are constantly pushing out tweets. For the Nationals, we have two reporters constantly pushing out, out tweets and articles and whatnot. But then we, in addition, the network will go to key players and key, key uh, front office people. So the RSN has a deal with Buck Showalter, and we'll have a deal with the Nationals manager. We'll have a deal with... Adam Jones for the Orioles and Ryan Zimmerman for the Nationals. And it, those guys are still out. Adam Jones is, a, is an avid um, Instagrammer. and I mean, an avid Instagrammer. He'll, he pretty much sends out uh, at least one or two or three, all three of his pictures of his meals every day. So um, uh, he's, a, he's a big eater, as well as a prolific uh, uh, offensive performer. And um, so, but Adam will be doing what he's doing um, for his own platforms, but he's also doing things for Masson. And as is Ryan, the, um, and and we felt that was key to um, getting uh, fans coming to us. We drive it through the broadcast. We're constantly uh, offering people text two nine two nine two. We have one hundred hundred fifty thousand people getting text mobile alerts. So aside from Facebook and Twitter and um, our website and our, you know people want to get constant updates from a variety of the different content producers that we have working for the network. And all that to us is just supporting the teams. It's all branded with the teams. We don't brand anything for Masson or MASN. Yes, the only thing that we really brand for Masson is the tune-in advertising we do. We want to drive eyeballs of the network for the benefit of the teams. When you do all that, when you have players and managers and everybody involved in creating content, your own reporters, and you're using the TV broadcast, the radio broadcast, at one point we were doing a 360 degree, we would have our radio announcers appear on TV, our TV announcers do bites on radio, getting our, our broadcasters, our on-air talent to blog as well, to come in and, and, and tweet and do different things over time. Um, when you do all that, you, another b benefit, and it's somewhat intended, but is a benefit to advertisers. We've created some really interesting, fully integrated advertising platforms. Because when an advertiser, a sophisticated one, sees that you can do that for your own brands, they're interested in tapping into how you can do it maybe for their brands. Um, so we've done things with Ford or um, HMOs, pharmaceutical companies, where we've tied in um, promotions in park, promotions on air, promotions with players, win lunch, with Buck Showalter to talk about the Orioles as part of the Care First uh, nu nutritional uh, uh, program, how they advise, and F Orioles fans, how to eat like Orioles and things like that. So you can touch all the platforms and people start to really want to participate with you, which, which again is not just about revenue, it's about participation. You want you want the fan to see that the advertiser values all your platforms, that your, va that your advertiser values the Orioles brand, the Adam Jones brand, the Buck Showalter, the Ryan Zimmerman brands. And, and so once you tap all these platforms in, you're, you're showing the value, and of course you're reaching demographics that if you, if you leave certain platforms out, you, you, you'll have holes in your, in your reach. From that same perspective, what are the best innovations that you've seen in terms of integrating 
social media. Maybe it's in the league. Maybe it's at another network or something that you've seen. Uh, maybe it's a totally different league. The best innovations at incorporating social media into the business of network television, the business of baseball that have really impressed you and said, yeah, that's a, that's a good place for us to be going. Uh, you know, the thing that we have the most success with is really isn't an innovation. It's, it's, and I mentioned it a second ago, when we um, get, the thing that moves the needle is, is, is the content and the brand. It's really not yeah. anything technical. Probably somebody who's more technically oriented than I can, can answer that question better. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, when we do contests, when we go on air and use the linear platform, because if, if you look at the quarterly Nielsen reports and people talk about the increasing in, encroachment of or, uh, digital platforms versus linear television, but I, we I, we don't really see that in the in the Nielsen reports. What we, what we see is the television linear television is still king. Um, people are definitely heavily involved in all of these digital platforms, and that will increasingly. I, I think the annual. Uh, rate is it's it's increasing by 25 percent a year and eventually that's going to have a, a huge impact but right now linear is king and people are using the other screens as supplemental and complementary to that now in baseball i think that's more true because until the games are on the tablets and the phones yeah. you'll never really know what it's what the potential is. And I think we all know it's going to merge. There's going to be full integration. But we feel like getting the players, getting the coaches, getting everyone integrated in all the platforms is what really moves the, the needle. And, and with you, Kevin, you know, ESPN has, uh, for a long time, the tagline has been the worldwide leader in sports. Yeah. One of the sort of secrets about ESPN is that it's also one of the worldwide leaders in technology. In what ways do you think that uh, – a sports network, and maybe in particular your sports network, can continue to be an innovation leader. And maybe you can also riff on what John was talking about, best innovations that you've seen. Two things. Um, we do we deal with it daily when we do the Sports Center Top Ten, uh, where people can send like nominees uh, with the hashtag SC Top Ten, which blows me away. You guys may think this is not a big deal, but for me, it blows me away. We could get somebody at a small school in Idaho, a game-winning three behind the back, last second, not even looking, a place going nuts. And suddenly it's on SportsCenter that night within an hour because somebody just uploaded it and then sent it to us through a tweet. And then we get clearance for it and we use it and it's suddenly on national TV. In the past, it would have been like, can you uplink it on a satellite? Can you get to this small little station? Can they transfer it over? Or can we dub it down to a tape and get a carrier who can take it somewhere and then they can upload it? And that process takes two, three, four, five hours. Uh, now you could do it within seconds. Uh, that's that immediate, I think, response we're seeing now through social media. What you saw during the national title game, I'm not sure. Did uh, any of you guys check out, of course, what we did during the game, but on ESPN2 as well as uh, ESPN News and ESPNU? I see a couple of you guys shaking your head. We did something very different. I think we're going to see a lot more of it. We could, we could tinker with it in the national title game. On ESPN2, we actually had a camera in like a, a small little room that was like a party room. And while you're watching the game in the corner box, you had guys like Manziel and Tim Tebow, Jamel Hill, and some of our sports center personalities like Van Pelt in there watching the game and commentating. And then on the bottom were tweets coming in just from famous people responding to the game. So you're getting that one. It's, it's basically in your own house, a party you're joined with, with some celebrities watching the game with you. Uh, now, on ESPNU, which I kept on going back to from the original game because I love Brent and uh, Kirk, we had four coaches watching from the All-22s. Now, the All-22s, that means it's a camera from an angle where you see the entire field. You see all 22 players on the field. So these coaches are all just basically talking about plays, anticipating plays. One coach actually called for uh, the fake punt that turned the game around momentum-wise, and it actually happened. So you're actually inside the room with coaches giving their opinions while watching the game. And I think you're going to see more and more of that in the next two to three years at ESPN, and I think you're going to see other networks bring it on. I think early on you're going to see it just with big games, mm -hmm. and then eventually you're going to see it on more channels because it's another thing, back to what I was saying, it fills programming, 
And it's an interesting way to look at things from the general standard, hey, I'm watching a game, play-by-play, color guy, here's where the ball is. Uh, I think that's one innovation we're going to see advance even more in the next three to five years. John, do you see similar opportunities for regional sports networks and in baseball? Yeah, absolutely. And I, just to give a, 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 a quantify something, on the regional level, we look at it that if, let's say we're doing an Orioles game and the game's doing an eight, doing an eight rating, when you look at the aggregated following or traffic uh, subscribers and whatnot that we have on all of our digital platforms, as we're, gen- as we're generating outbound content, whatever it is, an article, a link, a piece of video, we think we can are reaching, in fact, we know we're reaching, between two and three rating points that we're tweeting to. So we're doing an eight on the air, but then we're outbound tweeting to what is the equivalent of another two to three rating points. Now, that, that's a huge thing. Now, is everybody looking and reading that the way everybody on the air is watching the game? You know, when, the, when, the, when somebody's watching on the air, you know, they're watching. But that's the that tremendous potential, and that's without any live, in baseball, any live games or live clips on going out over our regional sports network, which eventually is going to happen relatively soon. So then that two to three becomes who knows what that, what that might be. And um, that's just that's substantial, and it's going to just continue to grow, I think. Since these guys come to us as fans and you guys and, and want to go into the industry of sports business or sports media in some way, you guys have done that, both of you, each of you successfully. How did you become a fan, Kevin, of sports? What are the what was that first moment that made you say, this is this is my thing? Um, for me personally, it, it's my relationship with my dad. I'm the first person in my family born in America. And my dad came to uh, the U.S. with $2 in his pocket in 1969, the American dream from India. And he lived in a YMCA for two years to, before my mother came over with my brother. So my dad was old school Indian. And on Sundays, the only way I could connect with him as a youngster was sitting on the couch watching Eagles games and giving him stats. That's the only way he noticed me. And uh, so I, I figured out at a very early age, Sunday morning, I had the comics and the sports section. By the time I'm six, seven, eight years old, and I'm consuming numbers, trying to understand what an RBI is or a TD is as a six-year-old is, is a challenge, but consuming those numbers so when I could sit down and – He's yelling at the TV at Ron Jaworski, the football player, not the analyst who's now a friend, or he's yelling at Dick Vermeil of the Eagles. I can say, well, Dad, this is, you know, understand why they're doing it because of this. That's the way I became a fan. And actually, that's what, uh, the way I fell in love with the sports casting ideas because I can educate. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell a fan to come off the ledge, it's okay, especially being in Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> and, and experiencing so much heartbreak. Now, when I was grow- growing up, we had the Sixers with Dr. J and Moses Malone. I was at the 1983 parade. My mom took me out of school to go there. It was, it was the coolest thing in the world. So I was hooked very, very early. Um, and the 1983 Phillies played the Orioles, and they lost in the world. I was hooked. So for me, from there on out, it was, it's part of my blood. It's part of my DNA. Um, I come home now. My wife used to be in the TV business and would say to me all the time, why are you watching sports and you just did three hours? And I said, I just can't help it. This is just part of my DNA. This is who I am. I'm never sick of it. Growing up a fan of Ron Jaworski, that now, as you say, he's a friend and you get to work with him. It's very cool. Uh, And I cherish those, those moments where I go behind the scenes with a bunch of guys that I grew up watching. When I was young, Bo Jackson was, was basically my idol and I had 11 posters of Bo Jackson around my walls. Uh, you know, I wanted to, to meet Bo Jackson, hang out with him, and then to do an interview with him 10 minutes uh, live on SportsCenter last year where uh, I'm asking, hey, Bo, take me behind the scenes. When you look at this field, what are you seeing? And he's taking the viewer with the camera work on a steady cam. We're moving through, and we're seeing Herm Edwards come in and you, Douglas, come in to try and tackle him. And he's, he's explaining, hey, all I got to do is get by you. I'm running over Herm. Uh, that, to me, is not only the 14-year-old kid in me saying, this is the coolest thing in the world, but the viewer at home is saying, I get an idea of what Bo Jackson sees with his own eyes. And to be a part of that, to actually take away that filter and allow the audience to come into kind of my little dream, it's pretty cool. And, John, it's a, 
slightly skewed version of that same story for you, right? You grew up a fan of Baltimore sports teams, and now your family owns a Baltimore sports team. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's similar and different, and I, do, I completely yeah. agree with what you said about sports being the, the reality TV. It's TiVo proof. It's, it's real time. The Federal Communications Commission, to use a very dry example, calls sports programming must-have programming, and they call it that for a reason because in this ever-fractured cable dial with all the, the audience going in a million directions, it occupies this huge fraction. So you and I now sound like a promo for uh, television sports. <laughs> but you make uh, a lot of money from it. Though, right? Right, right. Um, no, but it, it really is that. And there are a lot of reasons why that underlies the social policy behind uh, some of the things that go on in Washington. Um, I don't think you ever stop becoming a fan. I could na name a bunch of examples through the years uh, when the Orioles lost the World Series in 1979, up three to one to uh, Willie Stargell's uh, We Are our family group that was a crusher when you're 11 years old like I was and then they did come back and win in 83 uh, when Kirk Gibson hit the home run in 88 that made you made you a fan of baseball if, if nothing else could um, then little things because of the unique and very good fortune I had of of my family and others getting involved in this. Um, you know, I, was, I always liked George Brett from a distance. Uh, never didn't know George Brett. Met George Brett once uh, uh, in the early uh, mid-90s when he came to an opening day. The Orioles used to always play the Royals. And, oh, I don't know, years later when the All-Star game was in Milwaukee, my brother and I walked into... Um, uh, a restaurant in Milwaukee, and George Brett was there with Rick Sutcliffe, uh, who pitched for the Orioles for some uh, time. And uh, George Brett turned, took one look at us, and said, "The Angelos brothers, where have you been?" And I thought, man, that is really, really cool. And he's just a, that kind of guy, just a great guy. He remembers everybody, very warm person. Um, things like when I was a kid, Eddie Murray, um, who was a first baseman for the Orioles for many years, and and for a few other teams, and his. Um, was the third person in the history of Major League Baseball to reach both 3,000 hits and 500 home runs, with the other two being uh, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. Um, Eddie Murray was uh, an idol of mine, along with Brooks Robinson. The Orioles, back in the 80s, had a, had a lot of fortune, and then they had a downturn. We didn't own the team then. And he was traded away in sort of a not very happy way, as sometimes things happen in sports. And one of the greatest things for us was to be able to trade for Eddie, bring him back to Baltimore so that he could hit his 500. 500th home run in Camden Yards in front of the of Orioles fans. So that was a neat thing to be. If I, I was already a fan of the Orioles and of Eddie Murray, but you know I became, if possible, a little more of a fan of both. Um, one one last example of what something that made me a fan um, when Cal Ripken broke Lou Gehrig's uh, consecutive game streak. We had uh, very elaborate ceremonies, which uh, some of which you may have seen seen live or seen later, um, with the 2131 banners on the. Uh, warehouse walls and so forth. And, um, and I'm looking at a fellow with an Orioles hat on, I think. So, <laughs> um, so uh, as I'm saying that, I didn't notice you prior to that. Um, and um, we invited just about everybody. We had all the Hall of Famers, Ernie Banks, uh, just about everybody. And we, we, we didn't invite initially one person. And, and he wasn't initially on the list because no one thought he would come. And um, I said, I better call this this gentleman's agent. And I called a fellow in Miami uh, Beach who was the longtime agent for Joe DiMaggio. And I, I, I described to him what we were gonna do and what the ceremonies were and asked him if Joe would come. And I don't know how much you all know about Joe, but uh, Joe was this very a warm person, did a lot of things quietly, but was very private and didn't go to that many places. And Joe agreed to come and, and he came and he said, look, I don't really want to do a whole lot of the public ceremonies. I just want to come and sort of do my thing. And that's what he did for the first day. By the time we got out on the field and we stopped the game in the fifth inning, Joe, without any persuasion, had said, you know, I, I'd like to walk out on the field. And he went out on the field and really uh, not part of the planned ceremony, Joe ended up saying a few words turned to Cal, shook Cal's hand, and it really was the signature thing. So, again, if I wasn't already a huge fan of baseball and of all that it brings to people, that did a lot. And, and, and you know, I'll never forget, um, you know, uh, being able to meet Joe DiMaggio and really everybody there. I and mean, it was really like somebody who um, had walked in, much like the movie Field of Dreams. When Joe DiMaggio walked into the ballpark, it was, it was really something special. So those things um, make even more of a fan. But I, I don't think I'm any more of one than anybody than I was when I was 12 years old watching the Orioles, you know, in the World Series. Do, do you think you're still a fan in the same way that you were 
as a 12 year old kid, even though you've spent 30 some years since then, you know, uh, and, and most of your adult life in the business? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think you really savor and value some things that you probably w- wouldn't have anticipated. For instance, and, and we were talking about this earlier, spring training. Everybody loves spring training. But, you, you, you know, you've seen a lot of big games. You've been to all the big shows. Um, uh, you know, the, when we were in the playoffs last uh, end of 2012 against the Yankees, that was a pressure cooker of a, um, of a, of a, of a series. Every inning, every pitch, low-scoring low game, and... Um, and, you know, little stories like, um, I don't know how many of you, you are familiar with uh, Joan Jett, but Joan Jett's from Baltimore, and she's a big Orioles fan. Well, Joan Jett sat with us. She sat next to me, and she had, to digital media, which we've talked about, she had her iPad and watched every pitch on the MLB app as she was watching the game, which is, that was pretty cool, too. Yeah. You, but, um, do you guys know Joan Jett? Yeah. Right, I love rock and roll and all that? Okay. Yeah, so um, many. It was a little you know, scary, right? So, so yeah, yeah, right. So, so you get those um, kind of experiences um, that that you know you kind of appreciate going to those special games. But sometimes the little things, just sitting around in a spring training game and watching Buck Showalter uh, shoot the breeze with a reporter or two and his insights into the game, things you just never heard. Uh, 25 years later, you haven't heard. And a lot of that, you know, you meet a lot of people and the story never ends. And baseball in particular is great because of the huge statistical body and all the characters and mm-hmm. hundreds of players and thousands and tens of thousands of former players and just uh, the reverence that people have for the game. And it's, it's true in football. Um, you know, when I, uh, when I, you meet a famous football player, it's the same, but there's something about baseball. Did you learn, I'm going to come back to your take on that too, Kevin, but uh, did you learn something? You must have grown up a Colts fan also. Yeah. Or was there something that was powerful about that moment uh, when the Colts left? I mean, you were what, probably 13, 14 years old when that happened? Right. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, um, I don't think you appreciate the significance of it in, until you're older and in the business. It, it, it was powerful. And the interesting thing about the Colts is the Colts relocation. They're, they're one of the few. If, uh, the, the Colts have really kept almost the identical uniforms, the identical logos. The, everything is the same, yeah. you know, 30-plus years later from when they moved from Baltimore. So that's particular. Mostly that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen generally in sports, but in particular for a relocated team. So that kind of burn never really stopped. But, you know, that was, I think, one thing I learned about that. The, the Colts were pilloried for moving. Um, and that was at a time when that really didn't happen, uh, obviously successively, and it rarely happens in baseball. It happens more than the other sports. Now that I, I know now what I didn't know then, obviously as a kid and obviously as somebody that hadn't been in sports, there were actually some legitimate financial and business reasons why the Colts had to leave. But that story was really never told. They had a very bad lease. Um, they had to share with the Orioles. Uh, again, we weren't involved then. Um, <laughs> and it was just problematic for the, for the Colts. You never want to see see a team relocate. But sometimes I think people get hammered. And of course, I, unfairly, ironically, many years later, the Browns moved from a team that was from a city that was equally, by all accounts, rabid about football in the '90s as. Baltimoreans were rabid about football in the 80s. So, you know, glass houses, I think. You know, teams move. It's unfortunate when they do. You try and avoid it. It takes good political leadership. It takes good partnerships, public and private. And, and, and you hope you, people learn from those unfortunate situations where the Colts go to Indianapolis or the Browns come to Baltimore. I'm glad we have a team, and I'm, but, I'm, but I'm also glad that the Cleveland fans subsequently got their own team back and, and were able to keep their colors and all the rest of that. That was, I think, good for sport and good for fans. And one of your uh, partners, Barry Levinson, has made a great 30 for 30 documentary. Uh, it's one of the best in the series uh, about the Baltimore Colts band and how it kept playing even as uh, even as the team wasn't there. So if you haven't seen that 30 for 30, um, you should do that. So we connected the Colts back to ESPN. <laughs> And nice Kevin, segue. thank you very much. <laughs> I was practicing that all week. Um, but um, do you, I, I sort of admire the fact that you being so involved in sports can then sit down and watch more sports. Do you find yourself watching and breaking down storylines? And even if it's a game that you know you're not going to talk about? I love a good storyline, yeah. regardless. Uh, for me, I think if you talk to any sportscaster at Sports Center at ESPN, we just want a good game. Mm hmm. Uh, the Super Bowl, I had no connection to the Broncos or Seahawks. I just wanted a good game. Uh, we didn't get that <laughs> unless you live in Seattle. 
uh, because I like storylines. I like I like to talk about you know going back and forth. I like to see athletes, the greatest athletes in a specific sport on the planet, in the biggest moments. I like to see how they react and respond. Uh, to me, I think that is so fascinating. It's like going to a Broadway play and you're seeing. Uh, a famous actor suddenly on stage, and you are seeing them in their element. That's what I love about the sports arena. Um, I'm still a fan, but I'm a different type of fan yeah. now. I, I, I'm, I'm a little twisted just because I know a lot of the guys and the players, and I know who they are, what they are, and what they represent behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So I kind of look at things a little bit differently. Like if one person I know... Uh, as a buddy of mine, he really likes this guy. I'm like, hey, listen, let me tell you, uh, I'll just give you a warning. He's not a saint, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Or if they're they're bashing somebody, I'm like, no, he's a good guy. Yeah. You know, here, you know, a perfect example. Uh, I did something with Bryce Harper uh, a couple weeks ago, and Bryce and I were cracking jokes back and forth. Being from Philadelphia, if I mention the name Bryce Harper around any of my buddies, they're all going to drop a bunch of curse words because he is the opposition and the guy who's going to basically dominate that division for the next 10 years. And I was like, no, he's a good guy. And they didn't like what I said. And I said, well, he's still a good guy. Whether you like him or not, you don't need to root for him. I like hearing about that stuff and behind the scenes understanding why did this person do that? Mm -hmm. Who are they really like when the cameras were off? My favorite story happened when I was 21 years old um, in Philadelphia. It was the night Allen Iverson crossed over Michael Jordan. Uh, I was at that game, three rows underneath that basket. So to see that was pretty cool. Uh, now, Allen is, I think, a year or two off age-wise with me. So, I mean, to see a guy that I could relate to do that to, to the greatest basketball player ever was fantastic. It was, it was pretty amazing. Now, after the game, you're in the locker room, and back then, the 1996, 97, 98 Bulls, they were like the Beatles. And, I, and I'm not, like, I'm not going out of my way by saying, hey, you can't compare the Beatles. The Bulls were the Bulls. They were rock stars everywhere they went. So I'm in the locker room. I had talked to Michael twice before, Michael Jordan, you know, when a bunch of reporters had talked to him. And I'm in the corner. Everybody's cleared out about 40 minutes after they met with the media. Everybody got their sound bites. And I'm fidgeting something with this tape recorder that I was working with at the uh, university radio station. I look back up, and no one else is in the room except Michael and Scottie Pippen and me. And Mike, that night, Scotty had a very big night. Michael's giving Scotty all kinds of grief about it, about being the last guy coming out of the locker room and stuff. And it was like one of those moments where I was like, oh, I am that fly on the wall. This is pretty cool. In comes one of my idols, Dr. J. And now I'm sitting there looking at three of these guys, two of them at their peak at this moment, and the greatest basketball player I grew up watching in Dr. J. And to hear Michael give Scotty grief and then Doctor coming in and joining Julius and giving Scotty grief was surreal and amazing. And here the fan in me just sat back and enjoyed it. And the broadcaster in me also was like, all right, I got to tape this. <laughs> Obviously it wasn't usable, but it was like one of those cool moments. I walked out after that was done. And I'm looking down, I look back up, I'm in a corridor, and it's just me and Dennis Rodman. And at this point, Dennis Rodman was the full-out freak show that he was, you know? What do you mean at this point? Yeah, no, at right? that moment, at that yeah. moment was the 1997. Even bigger. Yeah. yeah, I'm in a wedding dress, yeah. and, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. And I'll, We're walking down the hallway, we're talking, and just, just shooting it. I actually made a comment about Madonna. He did not like that. I thought I was being funny because it came out of his book. But we started joking afterwards. And then, I, I'm not kidding, there were about 100 women at the end of this corridor right in front of the bus. And it's Dennis and I walking down the hallway. I veer off, and Dennis, I basically lose Dennis's body around <laughs> these women waiting around the bus. And I just see his head, and it's bleach blonde, and he's smiling with these sunglasses and all, you know, the tattoos and the earrings. And he's just looking back laughing at me, and then he gets on the bus. And that was one of those, it was like one of those moments where I'll never forget that 
hour of going from one to the other. And it was, it was a fan, but at the same time, it was, it was a guy who was understanding the professional world of what it's like when you move over from an athlete to behind the scenes as an athlete. So uh, deep down, I like seeing those stories. I get to see what these guys are like behind the scenes. Yeah. All of these students have come here wanting to learn something about being in this industry. Both of you have had a very nice run of success in this industry. John, what are the, what are the first steps that these guys need to take to make it in some form of sports business, sports management, sports marketing, sports media? Well, I think one of the steps you're doing, you're, you're, you're in, enrolled in a school that's giving you skills that will set you apart. And that's, I, I, we get a lot of resumes, um, both our HR people, and then I get a lot myself, and, uh, which I, I, I try to read and I, I try to funnel properly to our HR people so that people get the best chance. But um, I show people you're willing to pay your dues because sports is very much, and sports television is very much, and television generally is very much a pay your dues kind of a business. So get as much diversified educational credentials even if you think it's maybe you won't use it or maybe you won't need it, it may be the difference when somebody picks up a resume between your resume and the last 29 that they looked at. Um, and then do as many extracurricular uh, types of, of things that you can do that, that would really, again, set you, set you apart. Um, those cover letters that say, I've always wanted to be in sports, those don't really impact me. I'm looking for somebody that says... Um, I'm interested in a lot of things, and I'm interested in sports. I'm interested in learning and education, and I'm interested in sports. It shows that somebody has a little bit broader worldview, a little bit more of an ability to then think along with the people who are running the team and running the network in how they're going to help you as a staff member or an executive if they work their way through the company to build that brand and make that brand impactful. So you want people that come, I think, um, and I think you want to be that kind of person. I don't, I, listen, if you love um, one particular thing, God bless you, but try and get, 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 get exposed to as many things as possible and then put it on the paper and show somebody, hey, I'm a diversified sort of worldly person and I'm a sports fan. I think that would be the one thing that I look for and the best advice you know I could give you, and and one other thing I wanted to say about what Kevin said is that you do read a lot of things about players and figures in sports, and sometimes the internet and digital platforms are criticized because anybody can chime in, and you do have to take it with a grain of salt. There's a balance though before the internet, before digital platforms. It used to be everything got filtered through pretty much the local newspaper. Yeah. And if you wanted to run for public office, you had to get the endorsement, by and large, of the local newspaper. If you wanted to be a revered or loved football player, baseball player, you had to get the local newspaper to say that. And I would just encourage you that both at that time and this time to take these things with a grain of salt and to really kind of do your homework and not uh, try not to repeat the things that people just sort of cast about. I learned so much about people who were baseball players um, that I already, I, I, I thought they were good guys and I learned they were good guys. But there were just as often, I, I, I'd heard a lot of negatives about somebody and I found out that it was all nonsense, 100% nonsense. And whether that's a, a beat writer writing it or, a, or, or a, somebody tweeting it, you know, j just use your filter and use common sense. Until you know these people, you're, you really don't know what they're all about. So, so give them a chance, I think. And Kevin, I'm sure your answer to the question is, Kirksville, Missouri. Right? <laughs> yeah, starting from the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Now to to echo what John just said, I completely agree. Don't don't anybody can post anything out there with an agenda. Uh, until you meet the person, don't don't come to any type of opinion. And time and time again, I've been in that situation where I've heard rumors about somebody being a certain way, and then I meet the guy or the gal, and I'm like, they're great. They're they're fantastic. They're just like us. Uh, they're good people. So uh, I would always hold back from any type of internet rumor or commentary on message boards. Those are the worst. And I'm not sure if anybody's ever done them. They're the absolute worst because you could do whatever you want and put out any type of agenda. Just hold pause on, on casting a judgment when it comes to that. Um, to echo what John also said about uh, learning everything, yeah, absolutely. I, when I got on, on, on air, before I did that, I had to learn how to edit I had to learn how to shoot. Uh, I had to learn how to write. And uh, the writing is the most important. If you can learn how to write, you can literally do anything you want anywhere. Literally, it, it's, it's past this entertainment business. You can do anything you want. I think it's one of those underrated and 
overlooked aspects. If you can write, you can literally control your future. And when I say that, I'm saying I had, when I, when I interned, my first internship was at a, at a magazine, a sports magazine. And I had to figure out how to write my writing style. When I figured out my voice through writing, then radio became a lot easier. And then once radio kind of was under my belt, TV became even easier because the pictures tell the story. Uh, radio, you're describing something to somebody who can't visually see. Writing, you're doing all of that. You're painting a picture and you're telling the story. So I, I, would, I would suggest if you want to be on TV, learn how to do everything else uh, because it's not just about looking good when the red light's on. It's about being fully aware of the interview process, um, writing a story under deadline. I got to process something, perfect example. Uh, so the Wells Report, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with, it just came out with the Dolphins and the anti-bullying scandal or the, the bullying scandal involving Richie Incognito and Jonathan Martin. It happened while I was on the air. The report literally just came out right then and there. And in my ear, the producer's like, Wells Report just came out. You got 30 seconds, go over to the debate set. Uh, we got Darren Woods in there and we have Field Yates, who's an NFL insider. Go over there and we'll just figure it out. Now, I have 30 seconds to figure out what, what I'm going to pull out of this 144-page report, what questions I'm going to ask Darren Woodson. We're going to bring in Chris Mortensen and, and Adam Schefter. So you have to be fully aware of the story, thinking on your feet, understanding the right questions at that moment. Hey, you don't just get that by reading a teleprompter. You get that by understanding what goes on behind the scenes and the process. So I would suggest to everybody, learn how to do everything behind the scenes. When you do that, you will appreciate a lot more things coming your way when you're in front of the camera. And that extends to doing internships. Um, I did one radio, three TV, and one magazine. And I worked at the uh, college newspaper for three years because uh, I wanted to learn literally everything possible about the media business, not the TV business, because you'll know when you get into TV, they'll say, hey, can you write something for our website? That's not, that has nothing to do with TV. Uh, you have to be versatile because they're not just going to hire somebody who's in front of the camera. My name is Victor, and I'm 